All three of these pieces of feedstock weigh 37 grams. And so today I'm going to run them through my retort to see how much they weigh after they've been fully dried and then see what they weigh after they've been fully hydrated. We've had a window of dry weather and I'm going to go ahead and run a batch. And we're also shooting, uh, doing a photo shoot for the Furrow magazine. There should be some biochar in here still from about a month ago. And so I'm going to pull this out and we'll take a look and see what we got. I'm going to run the entire batch back again. Just wasn't complete. And so I'm going to run it again, which there's no harm, no foul. It just didn't have enough heat the first time that I ran it. So I'm going to run the entire batch, but I'm also going to be putting in new feedstock. This is gonna fit. Okay. Here are those pieces that were 37 grams. Right. So that I have good surface contact between the lid and the barrel because this is going to heat up and it's going to cool down. So the weight helps to ensure during that heating and cooling process, those surfaces stay in contact and there's no deformation. The material that I get from a B apiary locally here in town, there's material of different size and different configurations. So for example, these pieces right here, I select because they are very useful to go around on the outside of the 30 gallon barrel. So to answer the question, when do you use the retort and when do you use a trench or a pit? It just really depends on what I'm trying to make and for what purpose. The retort, it's a closed system and it's gonna be a lot more efficient. I'm gonna be able to exclude oxygen from this feedstock a lot more effectively than something like an in-ground open pit. The other reason that I choose to use this retort over a pit is because of the uniformity of this wood and how easy it is for me to actually place it within this vessel. I've got a very limited amount of space to work with and therefore I need to maximize the productivity. So it just makes more sense for material that's irregular, that's of different size, to go in an in-ground system like this rather than trying to put it inside something like a retort. From the standpoint of purity of the end result, this generally speaking is going to be a lot more pure because I have the ability to exclude oxygen a lot more effectively than what I can do over here. Now that I've got all of these longer pieces surrounding the 30 gallon barrel, the next thing is to fill up the remainder on top of the 30 gallon barrel. Now you can't pack it so densely that it's not going to have the airflow in order to burn effectively. One of the reasons why I had somewhat of an incomplete burn on the inside of this when I started is the material was wet. And so that's why it's important that you start with dry, clean material. So now I have to run this entire batch all over again, which is, again, it's not really a big deal. When you're making the biochar, does the wood that's surrounding the barrel on the inside, is it burning from the top down or from the bottom up? Yeah, I'm lighting it from the top. And so it's gonna burn from top down. It's gonna burn down to the level of the top of that inner chamber. And, and what's gonna happen at that point, this material is gonna start heating up, but there's no fire on the inside of the chamber because there's no oxygen. All you have in there are the gases being driven out. And so in order for there to be fire, you need to have that third element, which is oxygen, right? So you have heat and fuel, get it to the appropriate amount of temperature. And then all that's going to happen with the absence of oxygen is it's going to drive off all of those volatile organic compounds. 
those volatile organic compounds, once they come in contact with that oxygen, that will burn. And now it's coming into the secondary chamber and it's burning. So that's why they call it a retort. It's re-burning. Are there holes on the inside of the 30 gallon drum? And yes, there is. There's actually five holes that are five eighths inch drill bit that I used four and then one in the center that allow that gas to be forced out the bottom. But when I first started doing this, I started um, trying to get this in here as tightly as I possibly could. And what I found is that that just doesn't really work that well. You need to have enough air separation around this material that's going on top of the 30 gallon in order for it to really get going and get all the rest of this material um, you know, actively burning. So I like to try to put in random pieces allowing enough separation if you're going to make char try to make it as pure as you possibly can because it's going to last longer more pure it is you take all of that out and you're just left with carbon nothing's going to feed upon it and it's not going to off gas into the atmosphere i make sure this is going to fit on top I'll just leave this this end open. We've got a nice little wind going to feed the fire. And ordinarily, I would set this and forget it, walk away. Those sticks would drop down, close the lid entirely, and then I could come back the next day, and then I've got finished char. However, I'm going to monitor this since we're out here, and I'll probably add a little bit more just so that I'm well assured that I'm going to get a complete burn. You take a look down here. These are the gases that are being forced out of that inner chamber now and they're reburning. Essentially what you have right there, those gases that are being forced out of the inner chamber are your fuel source and that completes the, the fire triangle because now you have a fuel source introduced and in contact with sufficient heat and oxygen. So there you go, there's your visible flame that didn't happen inside of that inner chamber. It is the next day and I'm going to retrieve the batch that I ran yesterday. And I'll try to locate the pieces that I put on the top yesterday, the ones that I had weighed. So here's one of them. And these are fairly delicate. This one's broken. This one's fully intact. I'll see if I can get this one weighed. It's the driest this will actually ever be is right after it finishes processing. And so once you expose it to the atmosphere, it's going to begin to try to reach equilibrium with whatever the relative humidity is outside. It started out as 37 grams, and now it's four grams. What I'm going to attempt to do now is put this into one of my livestock watering troughs to see how much water I can get it to reabsorb and then how long it's going to actually take. This may not work because of how fragile this is. So if this blows apart, then that portion of the experiment kind of goes away, but we're going to give it a go and stick it in and see if we can get some kind of a reading. So as I introduce this to water, you can see that it's quite buoyant and it's floating. And that's due to a couple of factors. One being that it's hydrophobic, meaning that it's repelling water because of the tars and resins that have solidified onto the surface of this char. And it's going to take some time for those uh, tars and resins to break down. Also too, it's got a tremendous amount of porosity, meaning that it's filled with a lot of little pores and that traps air, making this completely buoyant. 
But over time, this will take on water and it will begin to, to sink. I've placed char in my troughs for various reasons, for experimentation, but also too for a little bit of water purification for the livestock. Kind of helps to clean up the water. There's some char down at the bottom over here that I haven't retrieved out. But uh, yeah, we're just gonna leave this in here and uh, see if it'll do its thing for a while. I'll put it over on this side so that maybe it'll get underneath this ice and uh, stay down a little bit. There we go. Check back with you later. Well, it has been just a little over a month since I put that test piece in the water trough and it's now fully hydrated. So I'm gonna go ahead and retrieve it and then we'll pull it out and get it weighed and see how much water it was able to actually take up. Sitting right at 20, 23 grams. It's still lighter than what I started with originally, although it's considerably heavier than when I put it into the water trough. So the final summary to this experiment is the percentage reduction in weight from 37 grams to four grams is 89.19%. And the percentage increase in weight after rehydration from four grams to 23 grams is 475 percent please consider subscribing to the channel thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video